I sat down beside him, holding the armload of clean dish towels I had just taken off the backyard clothesline. They had been rained on in the night, dried all day in the sun, and they had a delicious clean smell. Clasping them, I thought of Miss Walt's clean starched white blouse, her clean children, her husband's clean shirt. I know she must have left a clean house when they started out that day. Hereafter declared Carol, suddenly coming out and dumping an armload of newspapers on the back porch floor. If anybody wants to read the paper, you have to do it on the day it comes. I remembered wincing. Miss Jorgen gently removing a stack of newspapers from the sofa so she could sit there. Carol had a broom in her hand. She had just swept every place, chagrined that it had not been done before the Bollingers came, or at least before the Emersons got there. She had also mowed the front yard and cleared away her sewing out of the dining room. Don't lean back, she now warned Dick. There's a great big green bug on your shoulder. Ugh, Carol studied Latin in high school and German at DePauw, but when she speaks of insects, it is always in the Ugg language. Dick stiffened, accepted the dish towels I dropped into his lap so I could take the broom from Carol. He did not take his eyes off the steers. Now the first ones are coming back and the stragglers haven't even got to the woods yet, he murmured. I held the broom above his shoulder and the bug walked willingly onto it. It was an immature walking stick when I shook her onto the walk. The twig-like legs quickly dragged the soft body away. As I bent to retrieve the dish towels from Dick's lap, I noticed a large brown coffee stain on the pocket of my white blouse and cast a look of dismayed inquiry toward Carol. Yes, it was, she said, but I don't think anybody noticed except me. And Mary Jo McCracken was so fascinating, I didn't notice it much. By that time, I discovered the rip under my sleeve, she nodded confirmingly. But Mary Wright was pretty and charming, so don't worry. But believe me, I will never let the yard go unmowed so long again. Their routine is as natural as the way a colt can be sound asleep and wake right up when the mare goes past without a sound, continued Dick, still observing the steers. And I'll never get dinner again without first taking a bath and changing my blouse, I said. And I'll weed the garden and hang out the clothes in the dead of night. Miss Walls had insisted on looking at the garden when I offered her some fresh dill. We can quit eating, too, so the kitchen will always be in order, suggested Carol. It was time for her to dress and get her French horn and go to town to play in a band concert, and Dick had to go to the barn. I went into the house, and the typewriter, as I walked through the back porch, was an unfinished letter. I had started that morning. It sprang awake like a colt as I walked quietly past. Go on down to the woods and get a drink and forget the lost Lenore, I told it, walking right on. If they had to wait until we get everything in order, the time would never come and think what we'd miss. Emmett Bain's dairy barn near her burned one July evening morning with 4,300 bales of new hay in it. The May hay have caused the fire. The hay may have caused the fire, being not quite thoroughly cured before it was stored. It is a common cause of barn losses. Old-time farmers, bent stanger for one, used to scatter salt among the bales to preclude the possibility of spontaneous combustion. The smell of burning hay lingered in the air for weeks. In the evenings, the smell drifted sociably across to adjoining farms, like a farm neighbor who has sold his stock and therefore has time to visit his neighbors at chore time. 
it was the second major disaster for that family in the precarious hang season. A week earlier, Emmett had been struck on the head by a swinging hay fork, and the list of national hazardous occupations <clears throat> farming comes right after mining. At the time the fire was discovered, Emmett and his wife and their young son, Ray, were all ready to go on a vacation trip. The station wagon was loaded, and they were only waiting until Emmett could finish the morning's milking. He had arranged for a neighbor's son to do the chores for two weeks while they were gone. He did not understand why suddenly the power failed and the milking machine stopped until a neighbor came out into her yard and called down to him that his barn was on fire. They got out all the cattle except some young calves. To everybody's relief, Emmett had some insurance. His father-in-law, John Fielder, who lived near, had an empty barn, and they moved Emmett's cattle there. He ought to sell out right now and go ahead with his vacation, said one of the neighbors who would have been defeated by a like blow. There's hardly enough level land down there for a barn anyway, said another. Emmett was small, wiry, agile. All his farming life, he had gone from one farming difficulty to another. Hopefully he was a good neighbor, a soft-voiced, witty person, a good 4-H leader. At Silo Fillings, it was his job to work at the top of the silo because he was never afraid to climb. He met his emergencies nimbly, depending on immediate resourcefulness. The burning of a barn usually sends a farmer into a state of mild shock, sometimes makes him afraid to be alone in daytime. His fortune seemed to stimulate Emmett. He postponed his vacation. They took it later. He moved away the charred rafters, the old roofing, and within a few days had made plans for building a new barn on the same site, using some lumber cut from his own woods and some seasoned lumber purchased, purchased from a lumber yard. It was never really a convenient site for a barn. It was across the road from his nice new house down a steep, muddy lane. The stone was so close to the ground it was hard to excavate for a foundation. Nevertheless, he built the new barn there and by fall was milking cows and it again. Lacey was born in this house about 70 years ago. She told me as she stood smiling on the back step. A small woman who smiles often and seems always about to break into laughter. She was wearing a small hat with a with colored snail shells sewed all over the crown of it. I liked her immediately. She lived in a trailer now in Florida. I just wanted to see the old place, she explained. She had not been back since the death of her father, Benny, about 26 years ago. She said she had only a minute to stay. Her husband and grandson were waiting in the car, and the grandson had to get back to the IU campus for a final exam. We walked over the house, Lacey reminiscing happily as I asked questions. Where did Benny have the carbide tank buried for the gas lights? It was not buried, she said. It was in the woods shed now gone. He got scared and took out the lights after he read about a carbide lighted house blowing up. He left the pipes between the walls though and electricians met them in the ceilings when they wired this house for electricity meagerly during World War II when electric cord came only by priority and you were asked to use the barest minimum of outlets. In the dining room, my favorite room in the house, Lacey told me this was our living room. This is where everybody was laid out when they died. By the time we got to our living room, her husband joined us intending, I think, to tell her to come on. This was the parlor, said Lacey. This is where I done my courting. She stopped to laugh, and her husband said, 
This is the room your father threw me out of. Only it was your mother that threw me out. In Benny's last years, it was his bedroom. He died in it. The rooms all seem so little, Lacey exclaimed, surprised, but when I was a child, I thought they were so big. She remembered when her father went down to Bean Blossom Bottom, she said, and dug up young maples and set out in the front yard. They are giants now. She remembered the smokehouse, now gone, and the blacksmith shop, long since gone. She remembered the old soft brick colonial house her grandparents lived in, gone. It was out in the yard by the cistern. It had deer's horns built into an outside wall, Lacey said. She remembered her grandmother's silk dresses and bonnets, the cherry table, and handmade cord-laced beds. Why did Benny tear down the brick house? She didn't know. Benny's house, which they called the White House, is 80 years old in the new part, a hundred in the part that was made out of the, the old Wampler schoolhouse brought down from up on the hilltop across from the church. After the grandparents' deaths, a hired man lived in the brick house for a while, and Benny's family used the kitchen of it for a summer kitchen. When her parents went to town, six and one-half miles took longer than with a horse and a buggy than now with a car. Lacey and her sister did things, she said, once we moved the summer kitchen into the White House. Another time, they decided to fry a chicken. In those pre-4-H days, even little girls could dress and fry a chicken, but first they had to run it down and catch it, and then chop off its head. Lacey held the feet and couldn't bear to look. Her sister, wielding an axe, couldn't bear to look either. When Lacey heard the axe strike, she let loose, and the chicken, unharmed, took to its feet and flew, squawking. Oh, I wish I could stay longer, cried Lacey, who like anyone returning to a childhood home after a long absence found it full of memories, like flowers waiting to be picked from a garden. Some came because they were neighbors, some because it was a fine October day, a good day to go to a sale, and the country for miles around in Owen County was picturesque. On the way to the sale, we saw farm fields, little side roads, darting off to little farms, small quiet cemeteries, an old two-story log house with windlass and wooden bucket at a well behind it. We passed a small, pointed, white church and drove up and down Owen County's color-swept hills. Some came for old-time farm items to be sold from the farm that day. Stone jugs and apple butter, butter jars, glass cans, a cypress churn, ox yokes, sausage grinders, wood-burning stoves, coffee mill, horse-drawn machinery, and more modern farm items, a tractor, cattle, chickens, corn, and baled hay. What everyone got just for coming was a glimpse back into a time when the farm could support a family. The glimpse made you wonder about the future of such farms. The owners were selling because they no longer had the health or energy to do the work required by the farm. That this had been an effort for them for a long time was evident in the neglected appearance, piles of broken boards, pieces of machinery and clutter lay around all the buildings and along unkempt fence rows. The family had lived on the sandstone farm since 1920 except for a five-year interval when they had moved in with his father, father who was then too ill to take care of his own farm. They had gone through one mighty depression and numerous hardships, but it was apparent no one had ever gone out and neatened up the farm just from pure love of it. It did not have that look a farm should have after so many years of occupancy by one family, that look as if someone had told it, Oh farm, I love you, I love every inch of you, 
I could never bear to leave you. The small house had no flair to begin with. As it grew old, it had been neatly sided with a pinkish asbestos siding. It sat on a high knoll, looking down into a narrow, jolty road on thorough on through a lo thin line of young trees and down into a small cornfield on a neighboring farm. No power mower had barbered its grassy yard, but there was an old-time push mower in the sale. Beside the garden fence was a big brown glazed tile, the kind in which farm women used to plant flowers. The barn lot was bordered by great beeches, leafless that day and magnificently swathed in a silvery haze reflected in the delicate brushy ends of limbs. Is that heart-seizing landscape, the 202-acre farm, was like a hay rope with a series of big knots tied in it, the many small buildings occupied with various knots. There was a Swiss-like small shed on one knot occupied by two milk cows. There were more cattle in the old barn and in the more recently built one near it. Cream had been a major source of family income. The small lot between the barns, enclosed by a fence of horizontal sapling poles, was occupied chiefly by a large manure heap waiting to be hauled out to the fields that greatly needed this nourishment. There was an empty small log corn crib and a new metal one with corn in it. There were hog houses, a dog house, a wood shed. In the, meat, in the hen house, white hens laid eggs and cackled as triumphantly as if they had heard nothing about any sale. In a locked smokehouse, of which one wall was green with moss at the base and rotting away, several joints of cured meat wrapped in paper hung from rafters. Bean poles still tied together at the top like skeletal wigwams were still standing in the garden, twined about with frost-taken bean vines. The family had fed itself thriftily from the farm the farmer, his wife, and somewhat frail son had worked hard. They did things in the old, hard way, for example, carrying corn and water to the hog house on the knoll back up above the house. On one grassy rope knot, all the long-abandoned, obsolete horse-drawn machinery had been assembled for a sale. A manure spreader, a riding cultivator, riding and walking plows, a hand dump hay rake, two obsolete corn planters, two grain binders on which the wooden platforms were sagged and rotting away, wagon gears with wide steel rims on the high wheels. On another knot was the usable horse-drawn machinery. The mower used that last summer for mowing the hay now baled and sweet-smelling in the low-ceilinged barn. The newest note in the old barn was the no-smoking sign put up by an insurance company. The one modern piece of equipment, a tractor, sold for 600 In the barn stood three white horses. On the wall behind them hung brass-knobbed hames, harness, and ragged collar pads. One team and harness sold for 120 In the kitchen, neighbor women were selling lunch. Sandwiches, pies, coffee, iced tea, instant. Oyster stew. If you spill your stew getting out that screen door, cheerful Miss White told one farmer, come back and I'll refill it for you. The farmer's wife, dressed as if for company, in a dark plaid dress, sat quietly in the second room, waiting for the day to be over. Other neighbors went in and sat with her, rocking and talking in soft, solemnly cheerful voices. The sale clerk sat at a small table in the front room, 
and people went there to pay for what they had bought. The churn brought $12, ox yolks $12 each, the coffee mill selling for 32 surprised even the auctioneer. One sausage grinder with bench and much rust sold for three fifty. The other with no bench and less rust brought four dollars. A corn cutter that several farmers wanted for nostalgia's sake brought seven fifty. Finally, a woman wanting an old fashioned egg case. with a square slat box and a handle on the lid for carrying the case hesitated. The auctioneer threw in the old-time washing machine ringers and she paid 25 cents for the lot and left the ringers there when she took the case home. When we were ready to come home, Dick had bought a sausage grinder for nostalgia's sake and three fifty and I had bought a two-gallon stone jar for 50 cents because I think they are beautiful and never can resist them. Ralph's West Farm in Putnam County is 80 acres of the farm his father owned and lived on when Ralph was growing up before housing developments began to nibble it away. Westy's family is his Pretty wife, Polly, who collects and restores old dolls, goes to clubs and university alumni meetings, or can drive car, tractor, or truck for Westy, or even let him help her with the cooking in the kitchen or at the backyard picnic grill. Westy had come down to go to a sale with Dick one autumn morning and was feeling slightly guilty because he had left his corn picking. I'll get at it in a day or so, though, he told me, in the kitchen, waiting for Dick. When I start picking, I won't stop until it's all done. He learned to shuck corn on his father's farm in the hand-shucking team and wagon era. I used to be in the field by 6.30, and I picked two loads, 35 bushels to the wagon load by 1 o'clock. I never went back for that third load. My father always said two loads made a day's work for any man. I took the first load to the barn and unloaded it and picked half the second by 11 or 11.30. Then I ate a sandwich and slept half an hour and finished the second load by 1 o'clock. In those days, 60 bushels to the acre was good. Now a hundred isn't even unusual. His father had a strict rule that the corn had to be shucked by Thanksgiving. A common rule for farmers is that the growing corn must be knee-high by the 4th of July. One year, my father saw we weren't going to get done by Thanksgiving, and he hired six men to help. In those days, Indiana farmers shucked corn. Only Easterners called it picking corn. The shucking peg available <clears throat> is right or left handed models. The trained team, the phrases shucking and bang board, went out of the corn story when the tractor powered mechanical picker came in. When he shucked corn, Ralph took two rows at a time. His horses knew what to do, never got off the row, moved forward, or stopped on command. The one nearest the unshucked row was muzzled. I never used a shucking peg, he said. A hook is lots faster. When you take hold of a corn ear, you brush down it with the hook, and that rips the husks open so you can break the ear right off. While I was break breaking out one ear, I never looked at the wagon. I looked at the next ear I was going to shuck. You can't make any time looking at the wagon. In 1950, he bought his first corn picker. I remember it, he said, laughing wryly, because it was no good and I had to buy another right away. He does all his farming with the same drive and precision he used in corn shucking. He has quit raising hogs and raises only cattle. 
His farm is on a much-traveled thoroughfare close to Greencastle. He has had to move his fence back twice for widening the highway, so now his front yard plum tree is nearer the road than it was when he built the house for his bride. The farm is tidy and well-fenced, a hospitable, comfortable place. Take the car, Dick suggested, as I came out into the yard with a basket of things to store down in Monta's house, to which we began taking the overflow from this house as soon as Monta moved. But I wanted to walk just as a prolonged diet of biscuits sets up a craving for lean meat or sauerkraut or fruit a too long while in the house gives me a hunger to get my feet literally on the ground. So I walked down to Iris Farm, noting down there again how the wide circle of horizontal view changes now from day to day. Now, late in October, the distance seemed almost brown, with leaves gone from the trees, hills that were filled with green light all summer now were more open and revealed. All along the edges of pond and pasture, leaves had fallen. They were dry and curled up and blown into drifts. At the last, I came back slowly because it was the perfect time for walking slowly. Too late to start the ironing, too early to start supper. There is a place along the stony driveway there. I always walk slowly to watch for a groundhog that has a hole in the ground there under a buckeye tree. <clears throat> There I saw two quails. They came out of the cornfield and ran in front of me across the road to the groundhog's den and paused there, letting me look at them. They did not seem afraid at all. They were full-grown with smoothly dark brown bodies, pale stripes on their heads, and one wore a peak of feathers on the top. After I had stood quietly for a few seconds to admire those two, I began to see others quietly becoming visible in the grass along the weedy fence row. Under dangling wild raspberry canes, even against the edge of the groundhog's hole, the unmowed fence row had provided safe hiddenness for the large co covey of these attractive birds, which are Dick's favorites. The fence row separated Ira's road from a field on this next farm. The rule is, when you stand on your own land facing your neighbor's land, the half of the mutual line fence to your right is the half you are to maintain. If his cattle break through your half to get into your corn, there isn't much you can say about it. In summer, there had been wild raspberries, both black caps and an unusual bright yellow kind, in the fence row. There were more of them farther on where Ira's road becomes the public road, and our mailbox sits in front of the neighbor's fence, but there the highway keepers had sprayed the fence row. All summer, I had intended to dig up a start of yellow raspberries to transplant them into the garden to see what fertilizing and hoeing and the easy protected life might do to improve their small size and somewhat pallid, pallid flavor. The highway sprayers got to them before I did, but fortunately for me and the quails and the platoon of red-winged blackbirds, the blue bunting and the tree full of goldfinches that live along that road, the private fence row was not sprayed. How tidy should a farm be? How cleaned off? I like to see the pastures mowed before winter. They look better so even under winter's snowdrifts, but I think little corners and thickets, patches of weeds and brambles add greatly to the charm of the land, providing shelter and food for the little wild neighbors to whom also the land partly belongs, without the obligation of maintaining any fences except the invisible fences the quails maintain during the long warm summer days by calling back and forth along a boundary to each other. Another reward, more personal and selfish perhaps, 
is the sense of luxury to be had from seeing a portion of land from which a farmer has not been obliged to exact the last possible measure of merchantable harvest. And I can never get very enthusiastic about the efficiency of large-scale weed spraying either, whether in farm fields or along the highways and under power lines. Nature the resilient, the relentless, the thrifty waster, nature the user-up, the waiter impatient, patience, how does nature outwit man, the restless, dominating, arrogant, ingenious, self-contradicting waster? The first year Dick and Joe sprayed the cornfields on this farm, I went out late in summer to see a cornfield that had been sprayed to kill Jimson. The spraying had not hurt the giant foxtail. Jimson had been tall already when the spraying was done. The trunk and the first two branches had already developed to normal size. The nature of Jimson is to fork into two smooth, heavy branches then each forks again, and so on, until a tall, ornamental bush has developed, having leaves shaped somewhat like holly leaves. The unpleasant odor of its foliage has earned this hardy annual the subtitle Stinkweed, but its deep-throated pale blue-to-white flower has a delicate fragrance, pleasant in the cooling evening air, following a hot summer day. It is a pretty flower flaring outward like a long, narrow, gourd skirt and is pointed at the ends of the seams. A lawyer who lives in southern Indiana likes this weed well enough to want to plant seeds of it, and indeed in its early history, Jimson was planted as a garden flower. Its vice was simply that it was too willing. It spread. Its heavy black seeds developed in a four-sectioned, thorny and attractive pod the size of a bantam egg. When ripe, the pod opens like a tulip and the seeds come rattling out at every touch against the plant. Spraying in the cornfield has caused the later developing jimson branches to break out into many small ones with the look of water splashing haphazardly when a stone is dropped into a shallow creek. Leaves were curled at the rim and had turned a sickly yellow-green. The unnatural appearance was disquieting. <clears throat> no flower bud had developed, no bloom, therefore there would be no sea pods, and since jimson roots do not survive winter, the spraying had to that extent wiped out Jimson from the field. Dick's father always told me, however, that a farmer plowing a field turns under and covers weed seeds that will be there to plague his grandsons. I do not know how many years of spraying would be required to rid the field of weeds sprouted from these long buried seeds nor does anybody know what would survive the necessary number of springs. Thoughtfully, as I walked along the corn rows, disturbed <clears throat> by the deformed appearance of the jimson, I remembered a time earlier in the year when we had visited a small home greenhouse. Its owner, Hollis Labaw, is a registered nurse dedicated to alleviating suffering and illness a kind person and gentle by nature. She told us she liked to experiment with new plants and plant foods. She thinks there is some unexplained benefit in setting her transplanted seedlings in tin cans, something in the chemical reaction of earth with the metal, perhaps, that is good for the plants. She was then involved in an experiment with carnations. To some, she had given a new kind of atomic plant food. Beside them were others not given this food. The atomic-fed plants were larger, darker, slower to bloom than the others. It was a comforting recollection to have now, as I walked through the sprayed cornfield, 
If man's sprays and bombs destroy normal plant forms, perhaps nature will find a way patiently after long time to transform the evil into food and use it for new kinds of plants. Change is an essential part of nature's routine. Annihilation is not. Man's deadly instruments may yet turn out to be nature's surgical instruments of the future. Hope is she will not have to turn them against man himself. There are 40,000 fewer farmers now than last year, said the blithe young law student arriving at the farm. Just in time to eat Sunday evening supper with us. I don't know where he got that statistic, nor do I intend to verify or disprove it. It may be that the count was made when a number of farmers were vacationing in Florida, and so were counted with tourists instead of with farmers. I have read myself that the farm population is only 8% of the national total, but in any farming community, it is obvious that the ranks of farmers from the small family farms are steadily thinning. These farmers can now understand now how the Civil War veterans must have felt every year on Memorial Day when they got out their gray or blue uniforms to march in one more parade. Perhaps while there is still time, every farmer ought to set aside one pair of bib overalls leaving the wad of binder twine and handful of fence steeples in the pocket to wear in future thin rank farm parades. The day for this parade should be June 21st because on that date in 1834 farming received a tremendous tremendous shove toward its present miracle machinery era. Cyrus McCormick patented his new reaper. Horse-drawn, its principle was so practical that it has become the ancestor of today's prodigious self-propelled grain combine and has led the way toward a whole new system of farming. The French Academy of Science said Mr. McCormick had done more for the cause of farming than any man living. In 1859, Senator William H. Seward said, owing to Mr. McCormick's reaper, the line of civilization in the United States moves westward 30 miles each year. With one powerful machine, such as the one that picks and shells corn from the stock and spits out the cobs back upon the ground, one young man can tend a great acreage by himself. Farming is a lonelier job with all this machinery, and only one operator complained an old-time farmer. The farmer is the captive of his big, powerful machinery, said another, but farming moves steadily in that direction. If it seems strange, as one farmer suggested, that with all its marvelous advancement, the machinery industry has not produced a pitchfork handle that is warm in winter, there is a good reason. It could produce one <clears throat> produce one certainly, but the industry is not interested in producing a warm pitchfork handle. Its aim is to furnish machinery with buttons and levers that will eliminate the kind of farming of which the pitchfork is the symbol. The thin soiled stony hillside in the pasture behind Ira's barn speaks casually of such things as time amidst change. The simplicity of its speech is what makes it significant, and at the same time so easily overlookable. Near the top of the hill about ten years ago, I should say a great chestnut oak fell over. It was dead when it fell, but with a bowl thirty inches in diameter at the base, it must have made an impressive passage between the other mighty trees still standing in the hillside. When the topmost branches finally touched the earth, they had reached almost all the way down the hill to the creek's edge. 
and the torn roots still holding their fill of the stony soil in which they had stood now extended five feet above ground, and all the subsequent years rains and snows have not washed out the earth from the grasp of these roots. Looking at them, one can see how they deviated, turning, twisting painfully, evading, going over and under and around the stones to get down into the ground to nourishment and water and foothold. The pieces of stone in that clutch of soil are also old, bits of preglacial geode, shirt, mica, limestone, and sandstone. The tree itself is old, an oak is an infant at 50 years, a teenager at 100, middle-aged at 200. The fallen oak is not older than the soil, but it is older than Iris Farm. When <clears throat> the acorn fell from which this mighty tree grew, it fell on woods, soil, deep, rich, dark like the soil in some of the other parts of wooded hills near there. The oak knew hunters before it knew farmers. It knew Indians before it knew Indiana settlers who came with axes, their teams and plows, their tractors and brush hogs. Looking at this fallen tree, I felt the awe one expects to feel in the presence of a great teacher. Thoughtfully, after a while, I walked on down the hill to the creek. A log fallen across the creek there made a bridge to cross on if one felt adventurous, and the bank on the opposite side was grass-covered, sunlit. Beyond there, another hill rose, still forested with big trees. I crossed on the log and sat down on the thick grass under a young sycamore tree. The sycamore was in leaf, its sharply delineated fury leaves, furry leaves, full grown and already losing their infant powderiness on the underside. The old bark was peeling like badly sunburned skin, disclosing new bark, pale green and marked with the regular white lines that will also split later to permit the tree trunk to grow. Continuity is aptly expressed in the life cycle of a tree's bark. I leaned back comfortably against the sycamore and listened to the sounds around me. The ubiquitous plain representative of today's conquering world, the rustle and song of unseen birds in the lower trees, crows and blackbirds, more distantly in the cornfield. From that field came also the sound of a farm tractor. Above me was the whisper and soft laughter of wind among the sycamore leaves, and beside me the stillness of still waters. In the creek earlier that spring, water had rushed and foamed and beat its fist against the restraining stones, but now, sliding rapidly, twinkling in sunlight, rippling in shadow, turning the bare stones to a smooth, inscrutable green, it went all in stillness. Even when I knelt at the edge and bent so close that my ear nearly touched the water, I heard only stillness. There is a difference between stillness and silence. Silence... is eloquent but stillness communicates. When I attended Indiana University, my psychology professor, who always seemed more like a farmer than a professor, I thought, liked to tell us there are two instincts that govern man's behavior. One is the instinct of self-preservation, which is the basis of hunger. The other is the instinct for race perpetuation, which is the basis for sex. Ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, Professor Nicholson liked to tell us, as if a whole world were contained in that foreign-sounding sentence, and he explained it as a farmer might. It means in his development the individual goes through, in a way, the same process the race has gone through in its development. Professor Nicholson's final 
examinations began every year with the same requirement, define psychology as the science of behavior. In the years since I studied college psychology, I have lived close to the land, observing it with loving diligence, believing what it told me and asking it more. From this observation, I have learned that there is also a third instinct, as inherent and persistent as the instincts of sex and hunger, and probably more urgent than either, though not as soon recognized. That is the instinct of curiosity, which drives man to search for meaning. From it rises his passion to understand himself and his relation to the earth and to their mutual creator. In the natural world around him, he observes laws that apply to this world and its creatures. Many of these laws, such as the law of predation and nature's ways of keeping the balance, are painful to him, but inevitably accepted, and he suspects many of the natural laws apply also to him. Dimly, too, he senses the existence of laws that apply only or chiefly to him and impose on him a terrible responsibility not borne by other creatures. This vital instinct of curiosity impels him unceasingly to try to discover what it is that sets him apart from the other creatures with which he must share the earth, and what, if anything, actually sets him as an individual apart from other men as individuals. This is one of the reasons he must return to the land to consult it minutely again and again, to touch and learn from it, to be comforted and made again significant, giving an individual importance by communication with it. This is a long search. Man learns only a very little at a time and often has to retrace his steps and many times has to stop to find again the right direction and the next step. Brand Blanchard Quaker professor of philosophy at Yale University said in a little talk about what he calls the great commandment some time ago in the mind of man there is an inner light that always throws enough illumination upon his path to make the next step possible and what is important is that that step however short be taken that is it it is exactly the inner light of all creatures, perhaps, only man possesses the inner light, and the earth requires that he use it. We sat at the kitchen table late in the evening, drinking coffee, eating cheese and crackers, and thus hoarding the last few minutes of Nina's visit. In a little while, she would have to go out to her car and return to the city. Nina has visited us on all our farms and has also visited many cities in many countries. How will you like fish and algae farming, Dick? She asked teasingly. I read now that with the population exploding and five-sixths of the earth covered by sea, we may wind up getting our food and drinking water, too, from the ocean. I'd miss the cattle, he said. I'd miss the walks down to Monta's Woods, I said, refilling the coffee cups. It is not so much a future shortage of food, I fear, we could probably feed the world a long time if we could distribute our nation's surplus better, and we could all eat less ourselves, to good advantage probably. What gives me cold chills is the thought of land shortage, of not having enough land for everyone to have a place to go to now and then for that healing touch of earth, and the feeling of not being pressed against and for the solitude everybody has to have once in a while. In Maple Grove, we still follow <clears throat> the old-time farm custom of seeing a departing guest all the way out to the car. When we walked out into the yard with Nina, <clears throat> the night merely by being there was spectacular. It was the time of full moon under the big maples the shadows were so distinct, my first fanciful impulse was to gather up an armload to bring back into the house for kindling the morning fire. The yard beyond the maples was drenched in moonlight. In the sloping field across the road, 
the slopes formed a trough, and I could imagine the moonlight flowing down out of the trough to be dipped up by cupfuls to drink. It was a night of moonlit hyperbole. Even so, lights in the distant town thrust up a competitive reflection against the sky. My goodness, exclaimed Nina, there's so much more town light all around now than when you first came here. And in the houses, too, Dick reminded her, we didn't even have electricity in Maple Grove then. Now, from several of the neighboring farms, the brilliance of farm safety lights interrupted the moonlight. These lights come on automatically at dusk or in daytime hours of exceptionally dark days and burn with a cold, bleak blue light. Looking out toward the invisible highway on which Nina would presently be driving back to the city, we could see the warm-looking glow made by traffic and in the south horizon we could see the reflection thrust up against the sky by the growing university town six and one half miles away. Urbanization has catapulted toward the community since we first knew Maple Grove. Steadily, like a crouching, bright-eyed cat, the town reaches out its furry, sharp-clawed paws deeper and deeper into the farmland, snatching a farm here, another there for housing development, another for a shopping center, more for a school for university needs, for roads, a lake, now from Ralph Lewis's front yard on the hilltop near the Maple Grove Church, you can see the university's splendid new stadium looming up like a steamship about to come out across the treetops. Radio towers blink jewel red eyes jet planes pass above the farm unseen but felt creating the sound of soft thunder and causing the small birds to scatter out of trees near the kitchen the windows rattle in the farmhouse and the sound of the jets comes down magnified through the fireplace and into the dining room at night other planes go over above the farmhouse showing their red and green lights and losing altitude in preparation for landing at the small airport a few miles beyond the town. All these are the accessories of economic progress into which farmers are steadily drawn. Both university and town provide welcome jobs for many small farmers who must have off-the-farm income in order to live on their farms. The economic change in the community is created a change in the geographic structure. The farms grow larger and fewer. There is a new kind of soil loss, erosion by concrete and asphalt, as farms give up their fields to roads, houses, shopping centers, and essential services required by our modern industrial luxurious society. How pleasant it is here and how peaceful, murmured Nina, who has loved all the farms we have lived on, she got into the car and pressed a button which caused the windows to roll down with a little whir. Dick began to examine the windows with interest. Hearing our voices, the cattle came out to the fence and began to bawl softly as if to call our attention to the emptiness of the troughs there. From an anonymous hidden places in the tool shed, geese began to express their scorn of every word we had said. It seemed extremely pleasant to me. I was aware of a surge of deep love for this farm, to which I came rebelliously in the beginning, not wanting to leave the farm on which we were living at that time, even with the addition <coughs> of Monta's and Ira's 109 acres, this is still a small family-sized farm. The small family farm, I think, can be considered among our diminishing natural resources. It provides pleasant anchoring memories for children who grew up on it or visit it frequently. It offers some feeling of peace and normalcy to adults. Its very smallness is a useful stimulus to farmers, compelling them to depend on their own ingenuity rather than expect all their problems to be solved for them. Thinking this, I added aloud, but of course the basic philosophy of farming is opposed to the philosophy of the welfare state. I must go, exclaimed Nina suddenly. Dick stopped.
leaning on the car window, and we stepped back out of the way. Take care now, she cried gaily, as always, and quickly drove away. It is our family custom, when a dearly loved guest leaves, to stand at the back steps and watch until the car has reached the east road, the last possible glimpse. Then the guest sounds the car's horn, we wave, and the visit is over. We came back into the house in the buoyant, lifted feeling that rises up behind a particularly happy visit, like a swirl of autumn leaves in the wind. It is a feeling composed of many loves, love of people, love of the farm you have shared with them, love of the season, of the night of life, of the earth, and being able to walk about in it, and think and talk and be still, a sense of overflowing cup which you cannot really explain, a strong feeling of kinship with the earth, knowing that the earth does not belong to man, but rather he belongs to the earth, and this perhaps is the real essence of it. For man has known since long ago that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Man dwells therein, therefore he is a part of the fullness, and like it he is eternally important, eternally changing, and imperishable.